So that was a big block of serious because the guy had his house raided by the... I mean, when the federal government comes for you and you're a blogger, okay, and they have guns drawn... Unnecessary. So unnecessary. What do they think? They're going, they're going after a freaking Steve Zahn and Righteous Gemstones? I was thinking of the exact same thing. <laughs> same note, too. <laughs> no, man, it's like, that's, that's why, like, I would have thought, yeah, they bring the guys and they've got guns or whatever, but it's just kind of, hey, we got a warrant. Like, here it is. We got a search warrant. The paperwork guy. Yeah, would show and up. just like, okay. And so I got to sit on the couch and watch these people r- rip through my things and maybe even rip things apart, break things, sure. But the idea that, like, with, at six in the morning, flashlights and guns, like, oh man, we don't know what the reaction's gonna be. It's ridiculous. Ridiculous. They're always in windbreakers, right? Oh, you gotta let them know, yeah. They're where you, where, where you where from, yeah. right? Do they, you think those are like standard issue? Like everybody has them at their house? Absolutely. Or it's like yeah. before the raid, they're like, all right, guys, here you go. Everybody oh, passing out windbreakers. Like at the locker. Like, like at the locker. Like, like, hey, the you FBI group chat is like, hey, guys, we're wearing windbreakers. Stuff today. They definitely are going to a locker and they all look like Kyle Chandler. <laughs> <laughs> One guy's like, damn, I left my windbreaker today. So let me ask you guys a question because I've thought about this a lot. Have you ever thought about how you would handle a federal raid of your home? Because I have. I can assure you that I have never thought about it until you leaned over to me mid-interview and said, what would you do if the FBI raided your house? Yeah, I, like because this is something I've thought about a lot. And I've, I've arrived on, I'm going to be wherever, I, I'm going to be sitting on the couch, and when they come in, I'm just going to like take a deep sip, and I'm going to look at them and say, what took you so long? That's like, no matter what, I don't even know why they're coming in here. But whatever. Pretty when incriminating. They, I'm no. just going to say, what took you so long, right? And then, and, and, and that's the other thing. Like, if I get arrested, you know how some people, like, try to cover their face on their arrest? I'm going to be bantering with the media and stuff. Like, what's going on? Hey. Hey, looking good. Hey, what are those? Are those 12s? Oh, I like them. Yeah, You're going to be bantering. The jury is going to love it. I mean. Oh, my God. The jury is going to love it when they are then read after your banter from the prosecutor. Your Honor, he said, what took you so long when we walked in? It's a cool thing. It's a cool line, man. It is a pretty cool yeah. line. You're going to be thinking how cool it was when you're behind bars. Yeah. Just 25 like, to life. You know what? actually didn't do anything to deserve this. I'm going to make so many friends, though, because guys are like, that's the youth. What took you so long, God? Man, I love you. I'm like, hey, man. I've I'm heard just all a guy. about you. You're, you hosted Oddball with Charlotte friend. Wilder, Jessica's friend. <laughs> you prioritize content over your literal freedom. <laughs> hey, man, I'm, I'm committed to the bit. Mike, what would you do if the, the feds come in your house? How would you react? I'd take a cigarette out and say anyone got a light. Oh, see, that's cool. That's a good That's move. a cool one and not as self-incriminating. Yeah. Jessica, you got one? <laughs> I have never considered it. I actually just listened to a podcast called Scamanda about a woman named Amanda who was a scam artist. Oh, my God. Is and this Chris Cody's podcast? <laughs> Wait. He, oh, I get it. Okay, yeah. Scam, okay, yeah. yeah. I was like, oh, did you listen? To, no? Okay. Uh, she defrauded a bunch of people out of money by pretending she had cancer and now is in jail. And they raided her house, and they got her the same way they got Capone, Mm -hmm. the IRS. They're like, hmm, she's not reporting any of this as income. Let's look into it. Syphilis. That's what my (laughs) mom Also got Al Capone. (laughs) And they raided her house at the break of dawn, and apparently she was cool as a cucumber. Dude. And no matter what you do when your house gets raided or when you're on trial or when you're accused of a crime, someone will look at it and be like, that's suspicious. You could act cool. You could be freaking out no matter what you do. It all seems incriminating if people suspect you of doing a crime. Dude, I'm, I'm offering the agents, you need a, a glass of water, you want to make some coffee. I'm doing all that. Like He's so chill because so he thinks chill. he's smart enough to yeah. get away with it. Okay. Or he's freaking out because he knows he's screwed finally. I would like to change my answer. Go ahead, ask me again. Mike, what would you do if the federal government raided your home? Do you have an Astro Athletic? <laughs> Mike Fires or a Charger Packer <laughs> post 1999. Kyle Chandler's like, oh, wait, hold on one second. Let me think about that. Can I use your computer? <laughs> I- uh-huh. ah! <laughs> You're gonna need oh, a warrant good. for that. You're good. Tony, you, I have one. You That's got one? Here. Yeah. Oh, damn. <laughs> <laughs> my whole my whole criminal defense rests upon like. Three Jay Z lyrics. You have a warrant. <laughs> the glove compartment is yeah. locked, so is a trunk in the back. Yeah, I know my rights. You're gonna need a warrant for that. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, mine would probably be, guess time's up. 
Oh, guess time's up. <laughs> I get, you got to smoke something, though. Like, you gotta, I have I a like, cigar in my hand. I have a cigar yeah. in my hand. I like the ones where you immediately confess. Yeah, good good, good strategy. Uh, what took you so long is badass, man. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm disappointed in them at that point. <laughs> Pablo, you got one? Oh. I think I would just start speaking not English. <laughs> ah, the Sammy Sosa defense. <laughs> yeah, I'm going full Sammy Sosa. Where you do baseball late, is where very, you, very good to me. Where you do the late night That's talk what I would show tell the circuit FBI. before <laughs> years later you forget how to speak the language. I'd well, be like Greg Cody. Ah, f- me. <laughs> <laughs> or right? I you just coughing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd be like uh, Brian Cranston on Breaking Bad. Like, you got me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, man. He's like, Greg That's Cody. the most Who incriminating. Who needs me? <laughs> Who needs me? Why? And you know it. Roy, you're uh, making a your mama joke to the FBI. Yeah. Oh, then I would die. <laughs> I did that. What a way to go. It is a bit of a different experience for Roy, I think uh, history would tell us. Yeah, I do Americas. like the idea of someone trying to do a D's nuts joke on the <laughs> FBI. Are you a fan of Imagine oh, Dragons? Now I have my answer. <laughs> do you, don't forget to look over there for D's. Do you guys have Bofa? Don't come too close. I have Ligma. <laughs> So among the headlines that are crossing sports media today, quote, he always wins, colon, exploring the lasting relevance of sports media's clown prince, comma, John Stugatz Wiener. This awful announcing thing, of course, is something that I want your guys' thoughts on because I don't know if the piece could have sounded like something that Stugatz had dreamed up more if he had actually dreamt it up. It was one of the most accurate pieces of reporting I've ever read, to an extent. Once the shipping container, and specifically Billy Gill, was invoked, the writer lost me. The writer personally insulted me. (laughs) Well, we'll get to it. (laughs) But this was a tribute. It was generally a tribute, Jess, to Stu Gatz by someone who clearly listens to a lot of the show, likes the show a lot. A tribute... To someone, yes, by writing, quote, conniving, defiantly uninformed, and most of all lazy, Wiener embodies all of sports media's worst traits. Yet rudderless sitcoms sitcoms dads, Homer Simpson and Peter Griffin, his shameless incompetence is more charming than infuriating, endearing himself to a podcast audience that revels in his buffoonery, smitten by an oafish everyman, desecrating his profession with startling efficiency. I mean... Checks out so far. We can go director's commentary on this. Please. So the Sugat's character, while very close to, very clearly very close to the person that he actually is, on there, there were some embellishments and amplifications of how uninformed he might be, how oafish he might be. Lately, he's become the character. And he is, quite honestly, worse than ever at the profession. And for there to be a puff piece celebrating that at this point in time, when we're trying to get more out of him, when I'm trying to rein him in and say, you have these verbal tics, you laugh a little bit too much, we have to get better. You can't not know who Francisco Lindor is if you claim to be a Mets So that one, that one is real. The, the, this was the Aaron Rodgers thing is unforgivable in my mind to the point that there was like grave concern for his health. Quote, speaking almost exclusively in cliches, Stugatz hasn't watched sports with any regularity since at least the pandemic, wearing his blind spots like a badge of honor. Wiener's ineptitude goes well beyond the realm of gleeful ignorance, recently mistaking country singer Jake Owen for Jets newcomer Aaron Rodgers, a recurring guest he's interviewed countless times on The Levitard Show. A purported Mets fan, the native Long Islander couldn't even identify all-star shortstop Francisco Lindor, failing to pick him out of a lineup earlier this year. This is where Dan would certainly... Do the thing where he complains about how Stugatz is everything that Dan cannot be, and Stugatz gets credit for doing less and less because it is, in fact, going to result in puff pieces like this one. Stugatz, who famously went 0-14 betting college bowl games in 2019, has never been on the show less, spending the spring shuttling between Miami and Chicago to watch Northwestern's national championship team. 
That trend has continued throughout the summer, frying his brain with psychedelics while traveling for Dead and Company farewell tour. Thanks to Zoom, working and following the dead doesn't have to be mutually exclusive, though it is for Stugatz, who wasn't tech-savvy enough to contribute remotely, requiring significant audio and engineering assistance. Part of that, too, is it's hard to produce Sugats remotely, i.e. write for him, if we're doing the director's commentary, i.e. continue to prop the man up. So he can just get these glowing puff pieces written about him, while the author, who probably seems a little familiar with our show, should be fairly familiar with this construct. Are we sure Stu Gatz just didn't write this? There's one sentence. Yes, because it's actually in English and there are no typos. Most of the A-list <laughs> athletes that appear on the show gravitate to Stu Gatz, preferring his <laughs> preferring his innocuous watercolor talk, water cooler talk, to Levitard's more invasive inter interview tactics. I mean, watercolors actually seems it more does on fit. the nose. <laughs> well, we know none of us wrote this because then there's this lovely paragraph. Unlike producers who try to make Stugatz color between the lines, Gil, the brains behind God Bless Football, ah. knows what an unstoppable force he's dealing with, content to let the show devolve into whatever anarchy the two can summon from the depths of their neurotic minds. While other members of the shipping container crave airtime, eager to fire off punchlines and takes in a desperate race to the microphone, Gil would <laughs> rather play point guard, dishing off to Stu for easy layups. How does that feel, guys? How does that one feel? As someone that is often dishing off to Sue Gatz for easy layups, even LeBron James, Dwayne Wade-esque alley-oops, <laughs> a fair criticism. I didn't like the term desperate. <laughs> desperate was extra. Yeah. You didn't have to go for it. Rushing to the mic. Mm, that ain't I'm right. going first. <laughs> I wouldn't say that. <laughs> Sprit. <laughs> I love that we're beginning to explain to people who, I should say, before I say that we should explain to people how Stugatz actually is propped up, I want to ask, do we actually want to reveal, Mike, the depth to which you are throwing alley-oops to him? Because there are a couple moments this week that are my, some of my favorite all-time Stugatz moments. No, I don't want to reveal like the actual lines that, I, that he is fed because that's part of the show's majesty. And look, that's positive attention. Right now, all I can get written about us is Stephen A. Smith versus Dan Levitard. So if Sugats can be an attraction, great. But I would hope that it would be something that would be beneficial to the character. This just, he reads this, if he can read. He looks at this and he says, oh, I must be doing something right. Everything that, Dan, uh, that Mike told me in Tao was wrong, and I should just keep doubling down on this person I've become. If I may compliment Mike Ryan for a moment, Mike Ryan did a TikTok live pink pink baby pink doll we're not doing that stream look, through a microphone no. while stugatz was facing the tiktok <laughs> screen no. no we're not no we're not doing that no i am but a lowly producer desperate for airtime i'd like to weigh in as you guys are all uh variously in your feelings about the shots that you caught uh I'm not desperate i'd like to follow up with a quote a quote tweet from stugatz himself who said quote one correction Unfortunately, I still write my weekend observations. What? He does. He does. I fix the bad grammar. But he, he largely, th that's what he wants. <laughs> like his it, flowers for taking the 20 minutes out of his of weekend. The, week. <laughs> the quote tweet That are continues. often delivered on. <laughs> Go ahead. It continues because it was claimed that he did not write those weekend observations in the piece. Quote, other than that, pretty spot on and thank you. Yeah. Hey, Levitard Show, we did it. Yeah, I would uh, I would say I was far more active in writing those, that benchmark on my first run of executive producer, and now I just kind of let it be. I should have looked through this most recent one. I apologize when there was a reference to cardiac arrest. That was, oh, right. Yeah, that didn't. Uh... Yeah, that was just ill-timed. Because you guys did power through it, though. So he's taking credit for weekend observations after making a faux pas during this. An accidental Bronny James reference. Yeah, it, ah. it, well, he's it, an accidental cardiac arrest reference, and he wrote those before the Bronny James thing happened, but he knew as he was about to read it oh, no. that he was about to be in trouble, oh, no. but he kept pushing through the line. Power through. He could have said stunned. He could have said shocked, you could, but he went with cardiac Literally arrest. Literally anything else. Yeah. One of the things that I think about all the time when I host this show, because I get texts from people asking me, like, is this really a bit? I just love how it's actually hard to tell. The line between character and person for all of us, despite our levels of denied desperation, 
it it's hard to tell. It really is. And so in that way, it's both the magic of the show and also the thing that is eating itself as you do the show. So I, I compare all performative on-air personalities to wrestlers, especially in our industry, because Stephen A. is just an amplification of his true personality that makes for the best wrestling character. There was a point in time Neo where... Neo-kayfabe, I believe, is yeah. the term. Wow, good on you. Holy, holy. There was a time where Richard what? Flair just l- started living the gimmick, and he is now forever the nature boy Ric Flair. Mm-hmm. When he's on camera, when he's off camera... He is just Nate all the time. That happened with Stu Gotts around the pandemic where the lines were blurred and he just became the on-air version of Stu Gotts. The, I, look, we, we did a lot with it. But the Jake Owen, Aaron Rodgers thing <laughs> is, is unforgivable. It's unforgivable. I saw it's scary. I it, is. it is. It is scary. Boy really has the appropriate concern right now. I was also very concerned. I also saw last week that Jake Owen uh, got involved in the Jason Aldean yeah. country music thing. And th- at that point, I did recognize a little bit of a resemblance, just maybe in, what, in what did, Twitter what, politics between the two. What did, oh, but, so Jason Aldean wrote that song, I'm Afraid of Big Cities. Right. And uh, he is, <laughs> you know, like propped up by certain parts of the the country music yeah, about community. how he like uh, is afraid of the subway and stuff right? yeah 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 and ah, the rats. by cmt wanting to play it less it then got bigger and now you see ig stories that are not only posting jim caviezel's movie poster but also jason aldean's song followed by an andrew tate interview with tucker carlson that makes no sense it's a paradox i watched some of that andrew tate. i'm not proud of it I, i'm not proud of i it. don't get the appeal. investigative journalism for you pablo I'm trying. I'm trying to actually understand, like, truly, to what extent are any of these people you've just named playing characters, and to what extent are they real? And as far as I can tell, the only real thing around me is Chris Cody being confused as to whether the Mountain Dew hot dogs are real. I'm a little worried about Chris, too, because Chris is also saying. blurring the line. That's not Whoa, a bit. what does that mean? Chris That's is also a bit. blurring the line. That was, you that was can't not put a that bit. too close to the other conversation, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> what did I do wrong? I saw <laughs> something on the internet. I, oh. I mean, it, it looked like a real hot dog. <laughs> you were desperate to get on the mic with something, <laughs> as we all are, apparently. That's another, that's another thing that none of it, none of it matters. Okay, I'll, I guess I'll, I'll go down this path. But you mentioned Tucker Carlson, which it's readily available. You can search the internet for his honest opinions on the shtick that he was doing on the air, and it was a shtick. The manipulation he took active part in to personal benefit and success. And in fact, the things that have exposed some of those, you know, admittances were just involved in the prosecution and the investigation of Tim Burke we just interviewed. But it straight up doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. He'll still be made a martyr out of. Meanwhile, he's quite literally laughing at the people dumb enough yes. to fall for it because he knows. And this doesn't. This is not the unique domain of Tucker Carlson. This is now part of the shameless right. Is that, oh, it doesn't matter. Shame doesn't matter. That They'll love me for it. They'll make a martyr. They'll build up a defense for a crime that hasn't actually been committed. If anybody's culpable, it's me, but I'm the hero. Actually, they might have. They might listen to Sue Gods. Damn. <laughs> as we are talking about the characters we're all playing now online, in real life, as performers, we're all performers now on the internet. There's this quote that Richard Johnson provides on Twitter, excellent college football writer, and it's a quote from Duke quarterback Riley Leonard. Richard Johnson? Oh, no. Did I just use? Wait, no, why? no, no. He's real. He was, he was yeah. at the Jags tail with me. Love Rich. Yeah. I'm friends with Richard Johnson. Yeah. You think that's like a, a joke name that I accidentally said? I just... Yeah, his name's... He's made the joke before. He owns the joke, so you can't... Make, you can make the joke about him, but he owns the joke. So I, I think I expressed the right amount of concern. Proceed. I'm sorry. If it were Dan saying it, oh. it's one oh. thing. <laughs> that would be scary. I did feel Dan's chair kind of seep into my cognitive processing, but to Mike's point, what quoted was Duke quarterback Riley Leonard, who said something that you never hear across sports or really across anywhere at this point. Because Riley Leonard, Duke quarterback, said that he has not felt doubted much during his career. And so he asked his mom to give him some adversity, and she said, don't suck at the interviews today. 
The mom part, endearing, great. But the actual kernel of truth here is that you just never hear this anymore. I've been thinking about this ever since Victor Wembanyama came onto the scene. And the question I had was, this guy who's been proclaimed the greatest prospect in NBA history, this side of LeBron James, when do we turn him into an underdog? When does the guy who with that much hype also get to claim when that Sugats he is— When Sugats gets to do, a, do it in the playoffs, right? Right. But, but that's the thing about how we process information. Even the greatest, most hyped prospects of all time, the alpha males, allegedly, the people at the top of the food chain historically— LeBron James included, a guy who calls himself the king, also gets to feel like he's an underdog, that he shouldn't be here. And beyond the demographic explanation for LeBron, it's this idea of when your brain is listening to all of these voices we were never designed to hear, you too, Goliath, can feel like David. And so thank you for Riley Leonard kind of coming out and saying, you know what, on balance, people like me. Haven't really been doubted a ton. I just want more of that because we're otherwise always performing the role of it's better to be overcoming something. It's quite the bubble they have over Durham where the quarterback of the football team feels like he can't be doubted. Really? Your, take, power your take is that Riley <laughs> Leonard should never feel this way. You should never feel this way. If you play football for Duke, you should never feel this way. I, w- I would say in reason <laughs> that even Daniel Jones, who was a first-round draft pick, didn't feel this way. Sure, must you be? They won nine games last year. They're, he's really good, by the way, and I understand like his own personal confidence. But Duke is Duke. They're Duke's on TV having a moment. <laughs> They're having a moment. They're on TV more than Leave It to Beaver reruns, but not their football team. I have them changing the subject slightly on the topic of Duke, though. The Bear season two, a lot of Coach K Duke propaganda. I've been waiting Didn't to talk about this with me. someone. Why? I haven't gotten to that part. I'm like two it's episodes in. It's like the whole in, season. Though. It's a recurring theme. Really? It's not a spoiler, so don't get mad about okay, spoilers. Okay, can I can I be honest? I'm going to be completely honest with my opinion on the bear. And I know Roy had a, had a T-shirt, and I know everyone here likes the bear. We spoke to someone from the cast. We Love spoke to the bear. back. It's all right. Like it's my experience with season one was it was it, all right. Good. Right. It, I like the pacing. I, I burned through it, but it wasn't that great. Wasn't it's a good show. I, I, I'm waiting for I'm like season two it's to kick like up. It's not like a transcendent show, but it's a very good show. I think season two has transcended episodes that make it overall an amazing show. My mom said there's one episode in season two that's like the best 30 minutes of television she's ever watched. Uh, mm. The second to last episode of season two. Well, there are a it. couple of candidates for this title, which is why to me it's an amazing show. Some family episode. It has to do with family life. That, that's that's what she's talking that's, about. It's that's a supersized it, episode, yeah. and it is unbelievably dramatic in a way that is yeah that that felt real at the same time and sincere about family dynamics but enough coach k because you're telling me that sydney who grew up in chicago doesn't have there's like no other sporting analogy you can make for her like she's like oh i've never heard of coach k before i'm like i'm learning about his whole thing and she's reading his book throughout the season and i'm like this is a woman who is living in Chicago, was probably born in the late 90s during the Bulls' transcendent NBA title run in a city that is obsessed with Michael Jordan and has every major sports team, the two MLB teams. Like, I just don't understand how she's getting this co- – like, the Coach K thing. I don't get how it fits in. I don't get how she's like, oh, I don't know about Coach K. Like, that's, like, the whole introduction to it. It, it made me annoyed. It, it felt like a thing, and this is the one thing that I would I would peg on the writers in terms of my criticisms above anything else. It felt like the writers really wanted to make Coach K this inspirational figure, that they actually believe in Coach K. Because when I first saw it, I thought it was going to be a punchline. That there was irony in this. And it was earnest. fully unironic. An unironic depiction of Coach K as the paragon of leadership that informed even this African-American family in Chicago, passed down from generation to generation, the wisdoms of Coach K. I didn't get it. You got to go with the winner within there. Just saying. If there's one coach leadership book, and it's Pat Riley's. Have you read it? No, but I have it on a mantle because I like what it represents and what people think of me. I just feel like there's better sports stars in Chicago that would have made more sense. (laughs) <laughs> that aren't canceled because <laughs> if you look at the recent success it's either the 85 bears and Sweetness. Uh, 
and the the most recent Blackhawks. And maybe they just looked at their the voting record. The 2016 records. Chicago Cubs. I mean, there's there's other storylines. The Chicago Sky won the WNBA championship two years ago. Candace Parker. I don't know. There's what's other the, things. What's the book? Why are we picking Coach K? Get Coach K out of the bear. I think the, <laughs> I think the Duke Blue Devils will win eight games this season. In, in football? In football. Okay. So you told me – so this Riley Leonard character is somebody that I should actually know about. He's good. He's one of those quarterbacks that play that also play basketball, not unlike Drake May. He's like Drake May light. And, the, the, man, Duke's, Duke fans are going to be really pissed off by that. But Drake so, May's really good. So but the, Drake May is going to be a top five pick. But so unifying these conversational the threads, though, right? So Jess is being frustrated, as am I, about the unironic praise of Coach K. Mike is complaining about how a Duke player cannot possibly feel like he is not criticized because he's just not that good. It's Duke. Like, there's no adversity for Duke is a little weird. But to add another thread, it's the idea that there is this Duke basketball player whose name escapes me now, but is like the next Christian Leitner in that tradition, right? Who's that white guy on Duke right now who has been out and about as the guy that everybody hates? The Grayson Allen heir, the... Christian Leitner, the I'll Bobby have a Hurley. For a second. But I don't think Duke football's hated the way Duke basketball is, so you can't quite like Daniel Jones was. Uh, they, I mean, they beat Notre Dame in 2016. He was an amazing Duke quarterback, and no one was like, "Oh, I hate that guy." But I think what I want from sports is not merely people who are going to admit, you know, what I'm not an underdog. Like, if I were to tell you that story, I'd be lying to myself and others. I also want someone at Duke that's going to be unlikable and live up to Kyle Flipowski. The Kyle Flipowski tradition. That name sounds hateable. That's what I'm saying. You kind of want that guy at Duke, don't you? you kind of, it's kind of the perfect character at Duke is to be the guy who will say the honest thing and also, for that reason, be unlikable because the honesty of I'm not an underdog is actually the reality of what it's like to attend Duke University. Filipowski, don't yell at me. And if I got that one wrong, I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, I don't. I still have trouble wrapping my head around how a Duke football player <laughs> thinks that there's no adversity. Like, this is not the Alabama Crimson Tide. I believe they have a track around their football field. Like, come on. <laughs> you but you want, you that. Mike, but you want, where do you want your villains coming from? There's going to be like, a lot of Duke fans posting that eight turnover game in your mentions today. No, I understand. Oh, wait. No, there aren't really any <laughs> football fans. <laughs> <laughs> not, not me. I respect Duke. Dude. I mean, we're right there with you in the Coastal. <laughs> I'd kill to have that quarterback. No more Coastal this year. I know. It's a bummer. It's the end of an era. Can we, we only won it once. Well, twice, but we had to get one back. So Mike, using the royal we here, does link into something that I've really loved all week, which is just walking by Mike and hearing him operating on behalf of the University of Miami. So where are we, Mike? Where what? are we? It's it's July twenty sixth, and yeah. you're seemingly frantically operating. Mm hmm. What's up? What's up with the Golden Canes? What took you so long? <laughs> I will not. I will not be revealing anything like this. Those were privileged conversations. So, I would like to take the. <laughs> I'm going to take the, your steering wheel. Plead the fifth. And put it in the direction of college football daytime programming. Oh. Yeah. College Game Day finalized their uh, their talent roster for the upcoming season. I believe Pete Thamel is going to be taking resident serious uh, profiles. Uh, they've changed out quite a bit. Wojciechowski, uh, Rinaldi, no longer there. David Pollock is gone. I miss Tom Rinaldi. So he's on yeah. Fox now. He he's did on the, Fox. He did like the opening. So is Chris package for the Women's World Cup. The Bear, which is another lovable part of College Game Day that we've grown to to like his segments and the and the Bear sound that's moved over the to other, Fox. The other Bear. Yeah, Fox is more important. Bear. Um, they've moved over to Big Noon Saturday, which, if you pay attention, ratings they have incrementally eaten into College Game Day's lead for several reasons. It's not just. Uh, the Fox broadcast package getting better and getting better rights. The show has found its footing, and also the way that people watch television is changing. But we were we invoke College Game Day, where I gave the best argument a dilution by degrees with some of the talent decisions that they've made. I think anyone that has grown to love College Game Day over the years can see the clear difference, even though there's plenty of familiar names and holdovers still there, can see the difference 
and have their concerns that it's going to be a lesser product while the competition has gotten stronger. Another reason why the competition is getting stronger is because the TV rights continue to expand, because Fox is getting better and better games, because NBC now has entered the fray, and they're going to be getting better and better games, which are somehow once again soundtracked by Fallout Boy, who seems to only be writing songs that get picked up by college football broadcasts and previews. Yeah. And Imagine Dragons. It's it's the, the band, move. Not the joke. <laughs> Imagine dragons, these nuts. But, <laughs> but the uh, the big noon Saturday thing, I think, has a real chance. So they've done it. They've made a Pepsi that is actually to be reckoned with. You're more likely to watch someone on site of the big game of that week because you want to feel that excitement. It's a great driver for a, a ratings bonanza, and they the more rights that they get in big media markets, the more people they're going to get that are more inclined to watch people broadcasting from the site of their team's game. And when you include media, media markets like Los Angeles, that, that will inevitably lead to a ratings win here and there for Big Noon Saturday. But college game day, choosing to go to North – Carolina versus South Carolina, I thought was a pretty stunning first leadoff hit in how your football Saturdays are going to change because they're deciding to go somewhere that they have the rights to. And you realize there's a lot of good games that week, and they're going to, a, by comparison, a crappy one. Why is Chris Cody refusing to make eye contact with me all segment? With you? Yeah. I was listening to Mike. I was just thinking the whole time, I don't care what he says about the Big Ten, I mean about the Big Noon Saturday show, until they're playing, come into your city. I'm not watching. I'm with Chris Cody. That's it's all a, I need. It's a tradition. I got to play the air guitar yeah. in my living room at 9 a.m. Eastern. <laughs> I got to dance around a little bit. I got to little, put a little yin in my yin yang, if you know what I mean. I don't. And that's how my <laughs> college football Saturday starts. And I don't really, like, I don't watch the shows like I used to. But when there's yin in my yin yang, it's time. 